Hi, class. Welcome. I'm Dr. Fife, and I'm going to go over some innate immunity and inflammation. Please keep in mind, I'm only covering certain portions of the textbook chapters. You are responsible for reading and reviewing the chapters in their entirety in the McCants and Huther textbook. So we'll start out with some innate immunity and inflammation. We have human defense mechanisms. Um, innate immunity is two lines of defense. We have natural barriers and we have inflammation. Now, natural barriers, these are feet physical, mechanical, and biochemical barriers. Inflammation, um, if surface barriers are breached, then the second line of defense is for the body to do the inflammatory response. And this is activated so it can prevent further injury. Physical barriers, these protect us against damage and infection that are composed of tightly associated epithelial cells, including those on the skin, the membranous sheets lining the GI, GU, and respiratory tracts. Biochemical barriers, there's epithelial surfaces that provide biochemical barriers, and they do this by synthesizing and secreting substances meant to trap or destroy microorganisms. Examples of this are mucus, perspiration, saliva, tears, and earwax. Epithelial direct chemicals, these are antimicrobial peptides, and these are toxic to several bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Bacteria derived chemicals, this is part of the normal microbiome, and these do not usually cause disease. There's a mutualistic relationship which benefits both organisms. Here's just some different information on um, different areas of these uh, natural barriers. A uh, second line of defense is the inflammatory response. Now this inflammatory response occurs in response to damage to cells and tissue. Injury can, can be caused by infection, mechanical damage, oxygen deprivation, nutrient deprivation, genetic or immune defects, chemical agents, temperature extremes, and ionizing radiation. Now, inflammation depends on the activity of both cellular and chemical components and nonspecific, meaning um, it takes place in approximately the same way, regardless of the type of stimulus or whether exposure to the same stimulus has occurred in the past. There is a vascular response in which inflammation occurs in tissue that has a blood supply. There's observable characteristics such as redness, heat, swelling, and pain, which are the cardinal signs of inflammation. We have three characteristic changes in microcirculation near the site of injury. Blood vessel dilation, also known as vasodilation, increased vascular permeability and leakage of fluid out of the vessel, and WBC adherence to inner walls of the vessels and their migration through vessel walls to the site of injury. Biochemical mediators, we have histamine, bradykinins, leukotrienes, and prostaglandins. Plasma protein synthesis, this is essential for, effective, for the effective inflammatory response. We have the complement system, clotting system, and the kinin system involved there. Now the complement system activates the complement cascade. There's three pathways, the classical, lectin, and alternative pathways. Clotting systems, this is a group of plasma proteins that form fibrinous network at the injured or inflamed site. This prevents infection from spreading to adjacent tissues, and it traps microorganisms and foreign bodies for removal by infiltrating cells. This forms a clot that stops bleeding, and this provides the framework for future repair and healing. Cellular mediators of inflammation. Um, and if inflammation is a process in vascular tissue, and thus the cellular components of inflammation are found in the vessels and the tissue surrounding the blood vessels. So we have cellular receptors. Cells must recognize and respond to environment. Receptors bind soluble substances known as ligands that produce, produce during tissue damage or infection. And there's pattern recognition receptors. Those pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, must recognize molecular patterns of infection. Um, Damage-associated molecular patterns, or DAMPs, these recognize products of cellular damage. 
such as necrosis or apoptosis. Sorry, that's cut off a little bit there. Um, cellular products. Many cells secrete soluble factors that contribute to the regulation of innate or adaptive resistance by affecting uh, other neighboring cells. Now, these factors are referred to as chemokines or cytokines and are um, pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory in nature. Uh, systemic induction of fever by some cytokines. Now, cytokines, interleukins, and interferons. Interleukins are biochemical messengers produced predominantly by macrophages. Interleukins, macrophages. And, um, um, excuse me one second. Okay, sorry about that. I had to fix this so I could see what was on here. I was cutting off part of this. Um, and interleukins, these are biochemical messengers produced predominantly by macrophages and lymphocytes in response to recognition of microorganisms or stimulated by other products of inflammation. Now, two of the major pro-inflammatory cytokines are interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. Now, interferons are low molecular weight proteins that prim primarily protect against viral infections and modulate the inflammatory response. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, this is one of the most important cytokines. This induces fever, and it causes increased synthesis of pro-inflammatory proteins by the liver, causes muscle wasting, and intravascular thrombosis, and it's probably responsible for fatalities with shock caused by gram-negative bacterial infections. So tumor necrosis factor, fever, and some other uh, stuff going on there. Now, chemokines, low molecular weight peptides that function to induce leukocyte chemotaxis, this is synthesized by multiple cell types. It can be macrophages, fibroblasts, or endothelial cells in response to the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Cellular mediators of inflammation, we have mast cells, which are central cell in inflammation. Um, activation includes physical injury, UV light or x-rays, chemical agents such as toxins or bee stings, immunologic means such as anaphylactic toxins, um, activation of TLRs by bacteria and viruses. Okay, now we have mast cell degranulation. Uh, this is released in response to a stimulus. Histamine, which is a vasoactive amine that causes temporary rapid constriction of large vessel walls and dilation of postcapillary venules, both of which result in increased blood flow into the microcirculation. Chemotactic factors, we have neutrophil chemotactic factor and eosinophil chemotactic factor of anaphylaxis. Now, mast cell synthesis of mediators, we have activated mast cells begin new synthesis of other mediators of inflammation. Leukotrienes, prostaglandins, and platelet activating factor, these are lipid-derived products synthesized during mast cell activation. Leukotrienes, these produce effects similar to those of histamine, uh, smooth muscle contraction, and increased vascular permeability. Prostaglandins, these increase permeability and neutrophil chemotaxis. Platelet activating factor, or PAF, this is produced by removal of fatty acid from the plasma membrane. Um, endothelium, uh, we have proteins, collagen, fibronectin, and laminins. These contribute to regulation of normal blood flow by spontaneous activation of platelets and membranes of the clotting system. Platelets, also known as thrombocytes, these circulate in the bloodstream until vascular injury occurs. They're just waiting for something to happen. And activation results as an interaction of platelets with components of the coagulation cas cascade to stop bleeding and degranulation. Phagocytes, we have phagocytosis, which is the process by which a cell ingests and disposes of damaged cells and foreign material. Neutrophils are the predominant phagocytes in the early inflammatory site. These usually occur within 6 to 12 hours after initial injury, and it becomes a component of the purulent exudate, or pus. 
the eosinophils, there's two specific functions. There's a primary defense against parasites and helps regulate vascular mediators released from mast cells. Basophils, these are the least prevalent granulocyte, but they're an important source of cytokine, uh, interleukin-4, which is a key regulator of adaptive immune response. Monocytes and macrophages. Monocytes are the largest normal blood cell. They have an indented nucleus. These are produced in the bone marrow, and they enter the circulation and migrate to the inflammatory site where they develop into macrophages. Now, macrophages are important cellular initiators of the inflammatory response. Okay, some local manifestations of inflammation. Uh, these occur from vascular changes and the subsequent leakage of circulating components to the tissue. You can have heat and redness. This comes from vasodilation and an increased blood flow through the injured site. Swelling, this is occurring because of exudate, which is fluid in cells. This accumulates and causes swelling. And pain, which is usually accompanied by swelling and it's caused by pressure that's exerted by the exudate accumulation. Here's some different five cardinal signs of inflammation here. Systemic manifestations of acute inflammation. Uh, there's three primary systemic changes associated with acute inflammatory response. We have the fever, which is an early systemic response. And this is partially induced by specific cytokines. Fever, think cytokines. Um, fever causing cytokines are known as endogenous pyrogenes, endogenous because it's happening in the body. Pyrogens act directly on the hypothalamus. And the release of endogenous pyrogens by inflammatory cells occurs after phagocytosis, after exposure to bacterial endotoxins, and after exposure to antigen antibody complexes. Leukocytosis, um, this, uh, during many infections, the number of circulating leukocytes, primarily neutrophils, will increase. This increase is usually accompanied by the left shift in the ration, or excuse me, ration of immature and mature neutrophils. Plasma protein synthesis, this is the synthesis of plasma proteins, most of which are products of the liver and it's increased during the primary stages of inflammation. Proteins can be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory in nature, and they're acute phase reactants. We have resolution and repair. So the destruction of tissue is followed by a period of healing, and that begins during the acute phase of inflammation, but it may not be complete and may last um, as long as two years. The goal is tissue regeneration. So we have resolution, which is restoration of the injured tissue to the original structure and function. So, but if the tissue is extensively damaged, then resolution is not possible. So instead repair takes place. Repair is the replacement of destroyed tissue with scar tissue. Now, scar tissue is composed primarily of collagen, and that seals the lesion, and it restores the tensile, tensile strength, but it cannot execute physiologic functions of destroyed tissue. There's debridement, which is a cleanup of the lesion. There's dissolution of the fibrin clots by fibrinolytic enzymes. And healing involves a fill-in, seal, and shrinkage of the wound. Healing can occur from primary intention, um, wounds that heal under conditions of minimal tissue loss, or secondary intention with an open wound. There's epithelialization, scar formation, and contraction may take longer. The reconstructive phase, um, surgical wounds are completely sealed with platelet plugs within hours of closure. And for healing to proceed, that fibrin clot must be dissolved and then replaced with normal tissue if there's resolution or scar tissue for repair. There's activation of the plasma fibrinolytic system or release of lysosomal enzymes from dead neutrophils. The macrophages clear away debris and dead cells by phagocytosis. And there's regeneration of destroyed cells or resolution or repair if regeneration is not possible. 
The process of healing begins as granulation tissue grows inward from surrounding healthy connected tissue. Now we have biochemical mediators and cytokines. These promote healing. And the transforming growth factor beta, angiogenesis factors, and matrix metalloproteinases involved there. Fibroblasts, these are the most important cells during the reconstructive phase of wound healing because these synthesize and secrete collagen and other connective tissue proteins. We have wound contraction, which is the final process of the reconstructive phase of healing. Myofibroblasts, which are specialized cells that are likely responsible for wound contraction. And that's just the stages there of that reconstructive phase. Then we have the maturation phase. This is collagen matrix assembly, tissue regeneration, and wound contraction. And these all begin in that reconstructive phase, but they are not completed when the reconstructive phase ends. So this process continues into a maturation phase. And in this phase, we have scar tissue is remodeled, capillaries disappear, leaving the scar avascular. Within two to three weeks after maturation begins, Scar tissue has gained about two thirds of its eventual maximal strength. And it's important to note that repaired tissue regains 80% of its original tensile strength. So it'll never be back to where it was before. Compensatory hyperplasia, um, only epithelial, hepatic, and bone marrow are capable of complete myotic, mitotic regeneration. Okay, dysfunctional wound healing, um, dysfunctional during the inflammatory phase. This can occur where there can be hemorrhage, adhesions, infection, excess scar formation, or hypoproteinemia. It can be hypovolemia, oxygen delivery, and anti-inflammatory steroids that can uh, disrupt that inflammatory response. Dysfunction of the reconstructive phase of healing. This occurs in one of the essential processes is impaired. And we can have wound disruption or dehiscence where the wound pulls apart of the suture line. This may occur five to 12 days after suturing and it's associated with wound sepsis. And there's an increased risk of this with obesity. Okay, we will move on to adaptive immunity. Uh, the general characteristics of adaptive immunity, this is the third line of defense, uh, adaptive or acquired immunity. And once inflammation is activated, the adaptive immune response is called into action. So the immune response is aimed uh, towards long-term specific protection. We have antigens, um, so pathogens such as viruses and bacteria environmental agents, pollens, foods, or clinically derived such as drugs or vaccines, these can all be antigens, uh, memory function is involved, products of adaptive immune response, we have immunoglobulins, which are antibodies, and lymphocytes. So specificity and memory are the primary characteristics that will differentiate the immune response from other protective mechanisms. Now, before birth, humans produce large population of T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. And these have the capacity to recognize almost any foreign antigen found in the environment. Uh, generation of clonal diversity, each cell only recognized one particular antigen, but the sum of lymphocytes represents millions of foreign antigens. Humoral and cell mediated immunity. The immune response is two arms, antibody and T cells, and both of these protect against infection. Let's talk about antibody. Now, antibodies circulate in the blood and it binds to antigens on infectious agents. This interaction can result in direct inactivation of the microorganisms or activation of a variety of inflammatory mediators, uh, complement and phagocytes. Antibody is primarily responsible for protection against many bacteria and viruses. And this arm of the immune response is humoral immunity. Now T cells, there's differentiation during the immune response and these develop into several subpopulations that react directly with antigen on the surface of infectious agents. 
and this is known as cellular immunity. Both produce specialized subpopulations of memory cells that are long-lived and capable of remembering the antigen, responding more rapidly and efficiently on subsequent exposure to the same antigen. So it knows it, it recognizes it, and it responds faster. We have active and passive immunity. Uh, adaptive immunity can be active or passive, and it depends on whether the antibodies or T cells are produced by the individual in response to antigen or they're administered directly. Active acquired immunity, this is produced after natural exposure to an antigen or after immunization. Passive immunity uh, does not involve the host's immune response at all. And this occurs when preformed antibodies or T lymphocytes are transferred from a donor to the recipient. And this occurs such as with maternal antibodies crossing the placenta to the fetus or with immunotherapy. And here's just a comparison. It can be natural or artificial with the vaccine, natural immunity from the mom, or artificially um, with the administration of uh, antibodies. Recognition and response, antigens and immunogens. Um, antigen is a molecule that can react with antibodies or antigen receptors on B and T cells. Most antigens are also immunogens. An antigen that is immunogenic will induce an immune response resulting in the production of antibodies or functional T cells. The molecules that recognize antigen with antibody also known as immunoglobulin, and this is a serum glycoprotein produced by plasma cells in response to a challenge by an immunogen. So immunoglobulin molecules that are known to have specificity for antigen. Antibody, one particular set of immunoglobulins with specificity against a known antigen. Now there's five molecular classes, IgA, IgG, IgM, IgE, and IgD. Now, IgG is the most abundant, and this is protective activity against infections. This is also what you're going to see with um, the use of vaccines. The protective mechanism with vaccines is through IgG. Now, IgA, this is predominantly in blood and body secretions. IgM is the largest, and these are synthesized early in neonatal life an increase in response to infection in utero. IgD, the information on this role is limited. Um, it's located on the surface of developing B lymphocytes and function as one type of B cell antigen receptor. Now IgE is the least concentrated in circulation and this has to do with an allergic response. So important things to remember here, IgE, allergies, IgG, uh, in protective against infections, and including with the use of vaccinations, it, the protective effect is with IgG. B cell receptor complex, this is located on the surface of B lymphocytes. The role is to recognize the antigen, and the receptor must communicate that information to the cell's nucleus. T receptor complex, uh, antibody-like transmembrane protein and group of accessory proteins that are involved in intracellular signaling. And these are recognition and binding to antigen. Uh, molecules that present antigen, we have the major histocompatibility complex or MHC, and the primary role is antigen presentation. These MHC molecules are glycoproteins that are found on the surface of all human cells except for red blood cells. These are divided into class one and two, and this is based on molecular structure, distribution among cell populations, and function of antigen presentation. MHC contains genes that control the quality and quantity of an immune response. Now, the human MHC molecules are also referred to as the human leukocyte antigens, or HLAs. And this we see with transplant, transplantation, uh, with tissue typing, this is important. HLA alleles are the primary contributor to rejection of transplant. So that's why they have to do this tissue typing to make sure it's going to be compatible. And even though two people have the same HLA makeup, a graft or transplant may still be rejected because of differences between other antigens. 
Now CD1, uh, this is an antigen presenting molecule. CD1 molecules appear to specialize in presenting lipid agents contained in lipoproteins, glycolipids, and other molecules. And this is important with infections with mycobacterium. Molecules that hold cells together, we have cytokines and their receptors. Cytokines are low molecular weight proteins or glycoproteins, and these function as chemical signals between cells. Participation of cytokines is essential to the development of an adequate immune response. And there's a table in the textbook that lists cytokines and their receptors. You can look that over. T cell and B cell maturation. T cells, we have the central lymphoid um, organ for T cell development is the thymus. Cells are instructed by interactions with various thymic cells and hormones that undergo proliferation and progressive development of the characteristics of immunocompetent T cells. Now the final antigen reactive T cells are released into the blood, excuse me, and they take up residence in the secondary lymphoid organs to await antigen. B cells, this develops in the bone marrow. Um, interleukin-7 receptor is a critical in driving further differentiation and proliferation of the B cell. Primary and secondary immune response. The primary immune response, IgM is produced first, and that's followed by IgG, and it goes against the same antigen. So if no further exposure to the antigen occurs, the circulating antibody is catabolized or broken down and measurable quantities fall. But since the immune system is primed, a second challenge by the same antigen results in a secondary immune response. A secondary immune response, this is characterized by a more rapid production of larger amount of antibody than that produced by the primary response. And this results in the presence of memory cells that do not require further differentiation. IgG production is increased considerably and it makes it the predominant antibody class in the secondary response. Antigenic challenge is in the form of vaccine and occurs through natural infection. The level of protective IgG may remain elevated for decades. Now, the existence of prolonged and protective Protective secondary immune response explains how vaccines provide protection against certain pathogenic microorganisms. Like we said, uh, this has to do with IgG and vaccine protection against different, um, or different pathogenic mechanisms. T cell activation, the cellular immune response. Activation of the cell mediated arm of the immune response begins with the binding of antigen to specific T cell receptors. The naive T cell proliferates and differentiates into a functional or effector T cell. Now, there's two main functions of activated T cells, direct killing of foreign and or abnormal cells, and they play a role in assistance and or activation of other cells, such as macrophages. T cells develop into cells that regulate the immune response in order to avoid inadvertently attacking self antigens or to avoid overactivation of the immune response. And we have T regulatory or T cells involved there. We have T memory cells. These are produced to help induce secondary mediated immune responses. Okay, effector mechanisms, there's antibody function. There's a protection against infection. So the chief function of circulating antibodies is to protect the host from infection. Now, protection can be direct or indirect. Direct infection, the antibody can cause neutralization, which is an inactivation or blocking in the binding of an antigen to a receptor. Agglutination, um, or agglutination, excuse me, which is the clumping of insoluble particles that are in suspension. Or precipitation, which is making a soluble antigen into an insoluble precipitate of infectious agents or their toxic products. Now, indirectly, antibodies activate several components of innate immunity, including complement and phagocytes. Direct effects, there's protection against many viral infections that can be elicited by vaccination. 
with inactivated or attenuated viruses, and these induce neutral, neutralization of antibody production at the site of typical viral entrance into the body. And the level of circulating antibodies is the antibody titer. Sometimes we'll check that. Um, indirect effects, antibody can be protective by interacting with or activating components of nonspecific inflammation. We have opsonic activity, which is enhanced phagocytosis and activation of a complement system. Opsonins, which are antibody and C3B, make the pathogen more susceptible to phagocytosis. And opsonization, which is often necessary for efficient bacterial clearance because many bacteria have an outer capsule that deters recognition by phagocytes unless it is coated with antibody or complement protein. So that's where opsonization comes in. Okay, let's go on to alterations in immunity and inflammation. And let's start with hypersensitivity, allergy, autoimmunity, and alloimmunity. So we have hypersensitivity, which is an altered immune, immunologic response to an antigen, and that results in disease or damage to the host. Hypersensitivity reactions are classified two different ways. The source of the antigen that the immune system, immune system is attacking, such as allergy or alloimmunity, and by mechanisms that cause disease, such as types one, two, three, and four, hypersensitivity reactions. Autoimmunity, there's a disturbance in the immunologic tolerance of self-antigens. This is where we have autoimmune diseases. One of the most common you might know of is systemic lupus um, erythematous. Alloimmunity, also known as isoimmunity. And this occurs when the immune system of one individual produces an immunologic reaction against tissues of another individual. An example of that is transfusion reactions or um, reactions to transplanted um, organs, um, those are alloimmunity. All right, mechanisms of hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity reactions require sensitization against a particular antigen that results in primary or secondary immune responses. Now the sensitization can be rapid after one exposure or may occur after multiple exposures. Now after sensitization occurs, hypersensitivity reactions can be immediate or they can be delayed. Now, reactions that occur within minutes to a few hours are considered immediate hypersensitivity reactions. And delayed reactions, they may take several hours to appear and can be at their maximal severity days after re-exposure to an antigen. So let's go over these different types. We have type one, which is IgE-mediated hypersensitivity reactions most common with allergies, such as pollen. These are type one reactions. Type two, um, tissue specificity hypersensitivity reactions. These are specific cell or tissue um, being the target of an immune response. And there's a major histocompatibility locus antigens or HLAs that are involved here. Uh, a specific type of that can be here like the hemolytic reactions, um, Graves' disease, also a type two reaction. Type three are immune complex mediated hypersensitivity reactions. These are most um, are caused by antigen antibody immune complexes and that are formed in circulation and deposited in the vessel walls or the extravascular tissues. These are immune complex disease and examples are serum sickness, Raynaud's phenomenon, and um, lupus, uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis, also listed there. Uh, type four cell-mediated hypersensitivity reactions. These are mediated by T lymphocytes and they do not involve antibody. Cytotoxic T lymphocytes or TC cells and lymphokine producing Th1 or Th17 cells. Examples of that graft rejection, poison ivy, the plant resins, poison ivy or uh, poison oak is another one. Metals can cause this, nickel, aluminum, different reactions, latex, um, also considered a type four uh, chronic graft rejections. PPD testing that also can cause the type four um, sensitive, hypersensitivity reaction. 
So a little more on those antigen targets of um, antigenic targets of hypersensitivity reactions. We have allergy, which is a hypersensitivity response against an environmental aller antigen or allergen. Most common allergies are type one hypersensitivity reactions. Allergens of type one, we can be allergic to pollen, mold, foods, animals, cigarette smoke. I had terrible issues with pollen when I was in Florida. We had a lot of oak trees around us. Since I've moved to Colorado, much, much better. Very happy with the results. Um, type four is a plant resin, such as poison ivy. Uh, again, different metals or chemicals can cause type four reactions. Type two and three are relatively rare, but may include antibiotics, such as penicillin or sulfonamides, and soluble antigens produced by infectious agents. There's a genetic predisposition for these reactions, particularly with type one allergies or being atopic. Clinical symptoms of type one allergies, uh, manifestations most often due to histamine, which is why we take antihistamines to reverse that reaction. Um, most commonly affected are the GI tract, skin, and respiratory tract. Uh, can have conjunctivitis, rhinitis, or asthma. Symptoms caused by vasodilation, hypersecretion of mucus, edema, and swelling of respiratory mucosa. Now, GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Patient may have urticaria or hives, which is a skin manifestation of a type one allergic reaction. This can be a wheel or a flare reaction, usually accompanied by itching. Um, autoimmunity and L immunity, a little bit about those. Autoimmunity is the breakdown of tolerance in which the body's immune system uh, begins to recognize self antigens as foreign. And alloimmunity, again, occurs when the individual's immune system reacts to antigens of, on the tissues of other members of the same species, such as transplant or transfusion rejections or reactions. Transient neonatal disease can also be caused. Um, this is from maternal immune system becomes sensitized against antigens expressed by the fetus. So it's a reaction going on between the mom and the fetus. Symptoms of alloimmune disease may be present in utero or immediately after birth, and these can be fatal to the fetus or the neonate. Examples of this are the maternal immunologic hypersensitivity diseases that can affect the child, Graves disease, myasthenia gravis, immune thrombocytic uh, cytopenic purpura, alloimmune neutropenia, and systemic lupus erythematis. So a little more on um, autoimmunity. Let's go over that with um, systemic lupus erythematis. This is a chronic multi-system inflammatory disease and is one of the most common, complex, and serious of the autoimmune disorders. There's a production of a large variety of autoantibodies against nucleic acids, erythrocytes, coagulation proteins, phospholipids, lymphocytes, platelets, and many other cell components. Clinical manifestations, patient may have arthralgias and arthritis, vasculitis and rash, some, excuse me, hematologic abnormalities of anemia and cardiovascular diseases. The facial, facial rash, which is called a malar rash, discoid rash appearing in other areas of the skin, uh, photosensitivity, oral and nasopharyngeal ulcers, arthritis, serositis, renal disorder, neurologic and immunologic disorders. There is no cure for this and treatment is to prevent further damage by re suppressing that immune response. And here's just some examples of different areas of the body affected by lupus. Now, a transfusion reaction. Um, RBCs or erythrocytes, they express several important surface antigens known collectively as the blood group antigens. So there's more than 80 different red cell antigens grouped into several dozen blood group subsystems. We have the ABO and RH systems that provoke the strongest alloimmune response. Four different blood types, AB, AB, or O. If a person with A receives B blood, then a transfusion reaction will occur. Now, type O lacks both types of antigens, A or B, and they are the universal donors. 
The RH blood group is the most um, polymorphic system of red cell antigens consisting of at least 50 different um, antigens. It can be RH positive or RH negative. And we have IgG anti-D alloantibody, which is produced by an RH negative mom against an RH positive fetus. Uh, that's the primary cause of the RH maternal fetal incompatibility and results in hemolytic disease of the newborn. So we treat this by giving the mom the prophylactic anti-D immunoglobulin. All right, deficiencies in immunity uh, disorders resulting from immune deficiency are those clinical sequelae of impaired function of one or more components of the immune or inflammatory response, including B cells, T cells, phagocytes, and complement. Immune deficiency is the failure of these mechanisms of self-defense to function at their normal capacity, and this results in increased susceptibility to infection. Primary or congenital, this is an immune deficiency caused by a genetic anomaly. Most often are the result of a single gene defect. Mutations are sporadic and not inherited. Secondary or acquired, the immune deficiency is caused by another illness, such as cancer or a viral infection, or by normal physiologic changes, such as aging. Okay, last we're going to go over here are some on infection. Now, microorganisms, we have a normal microbiome. So these are the resident microorganisms found in different parts of the body, including the skin, mouth, GI tract, respiratory tract, and genital tract. And this here just lists some different microbiota in these different regions. Um, not important to memorize that. A uh, symbiotic relationship with the normal flora can be breached as a result of injury that compromises that physical protective barrier. We have opportunistic microorganisms. Uh, they see an opportunity and they take it. So they would not normally cause disease, but they see that opportunity to do so when the defense systems are weakened. True pathogens, these are devised uh, means to circumvent the individual's defenses and directly cause infection. Microorganisms and infections, we have colonization, which the infectious microorganisms usually exist in reservoirs, environment, animals, and humans. Now in animals, there can be direct or indirect contact with vectors, insects, fleas, mosquitoes, fecal oral, this is um, infection through food or water. We can get salmonella or polio are examples of that. Human to human, respiratory droplets, what we saw with COVID. Uh, physical contact, such as uh, sexually transmitted infections, hepatitis B, mother to child across the placenta, the cytomegalovirus, chlamydia and candida can be transferred that way. And after deposition in receptive environments for colonization, the microorganism stabilizes the adherence to the tissue through specific surface receptors. Now we have invasion, which once colonization has occurred, the infectious agents can invade the surrounding tissue and other sites. Multiplication, uh, within a warm nutrient-filled environment of human tissue, most microorganisms undergo rapid multiplication with production of many new infectious progeny. Spread, this is localized infection that may become invasive. It can enter lymphatics, the blood, such as causing septicemia or internal organs. Clinical infectious disease, the clinical process occurs in four stages. Incubation, which is that initial exposure to onset of symptoms. Um, prodromal, the occurrence of initial symptoms, which are often mild, getting a little bit of a sore throat, starting to feel a little more getting run down. Um, invasion, a pathogen is multiplying rapidly and it evades farther and affecting the tissues. And you have an immune and inflammatory responses are triggered when an invasion occurs. Convalescence, the immune inflammatory systems have successfully removed the infectious agent. They did their job, and so the symptoms decline. But the disease may be fatal, or it may enter a latency phase with different types of disease processes. Factors that influence the capacity of the pathogen to cause disease, communicability, this is the ability of it to spread from one person to another. Immunogenicity is the ability of pathogens to induce an immune response. 
Infectivity is the ability of pathogens to invade and multiply in the host. Mechanism of action is how the microorganism damages the tissue. Pathogenicity is the ability of the agent to produce disease. The portal of entry is the route by which the pathogenic microorganism infects the host. Toxigenicity is the ability to produce soluble toxins or endotoxins. And virulence is the capacity of a pathogen to cause severe disease. Now, infectious diseases are classified by prevalence and spread within the community. It can be endemic, which diseases with relatively high but constant rates of infection in a particular population. Epidemic is when there's new, uh, a number of new infections in a particular population greatly exceed the number usually observed. And the pandemic, which we're all familiar with, with COVID. And it's an epidemic that spreads over a large area, such as continent or worldwide. And this is just showing examples of those things. Classes of infectious microorganisms, let's talk about bacteria first. Bacteria are prokaryotic, unicellular microorganisms with no nuclei, mitochondria, or membrane-bound organelles. No true bacteria, these divide by binary fission and may have a variety of morphologies. Most disease-causing bacteria fall into this category. We have cocci, bacilli, vibrios, and spirilla examples there. Filamentous, these may have branching or myocellin in them, like structures that resemble fungi. And this can be seen with mycobacterium tuberculosis. Spirochetes. These are flexible spiral filaments that are modal. And these, most of these are anaerobic. And an example of this is the T. palladium, um, or known as syphilis. Uh, mycoplasm lack a rigid cell wall and are small and pleomorphic. And these are the smallest and most simple bacteria. An example of that is the mycoplasm pneumonia. Rickettsia, this is strict intracellular parasite that can be rod-shaped spherical or pleomorphic, typically spread by insect vectors, uh, rickettsia, rickettsia, or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and it's an example of that. Chlamydia, this is strict intracellular parasites, but with more complex intracellular life cycles, and that's chlamydia trachomotis. A bacteria against are categorized as gram-negative or gram-positive, Gram negative do not retain crystal violet dye in the gram staining process, whereas gram positive do retain the crystal violet dye. Now, gram negative also have that liposaccharide or LPS coat on the outer membrane. So, it's, that's an important thing to differentiate the difference between the gram negative and gram positive. The gram negative have that lipopolysaccharide um, coating on the outer membrane. Bacterial infection, invasion, and evasion. Invasion results in direct confrontation with the individual's primary defense mechanisms against bacteria. And this includes the complement system, antibodies, and phagocytes. Pathogens produce a variety of toxic molecules that may kill the individual's cells, disrupt the tissue, and protect against inflammation. We have exotoxins, which are proteins that are released during bacterial growth. These have highly specific effects, cytotoxins, neurotoxins, pneumotoxins, enterotoxins, and hemolysins. Exotoxins can damage the cell membrane, they activate second messengers, and they inhibit protein synthesis. Exotoxins are immunogenic, and they elicit the production of antibodies known as antitoxins. Now, vaccines are available for many exotoxins, such as tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Endotoxins, these are those liposaccharides or LPS. Uh, these are contained in the cell walls of gram-negative bacteria, and these are released during lysis or destruction of the bacteria. Bacteria that produce endotoxins are called pyrogenic bacteria because they stimulate the release of inflammatory mediators produce fever, and local and systemic effects of inflammation. 
fungal infections. These are eukaryotic microorganisms with thick, rigid cell walls and the capacity to form a variety of complex structures. So fungi might grow as a mold, meshwork, yeast, or dimorphic. The cell wall is composed of polysaccharides that differ from the peptinoglycans of bacteria. Infection um, with fungus is mycosis. Now, most pathogenic fungi grow as saprophytes in the environment and are transmitted by inhalation or contamination of wounds. We have dermatophytes or the tinnias, which are by human to human transmission, uh, yeast or candida. And then we have invasion and evasion. So we have T lymphocytes that are crucial in limiting the extent of infection and producing cytokines to further activate macrophages. So if there's an issue with the T lymphocytes, uh, a person can be more prone to these uh, infections. Tissue damage, fungal infections can damage tissue directly. They secrete enzymes and they can do it indirectly by initiating an inflammatory response. Parasitic and protozoal infections. Parasitic organisms establish symbiosis with another species in which the parasite benefits at the exposure of the other species. Parasites range from unicellular protozoal to large worms. The parasitic worms are helminths. These include intestinal and tissue nematodes, which are hookworms or roundworms, or flukes, such as liver or lung fluke, and tapeworms. Protozoal um, is eukaryotic, they're unicellular microorganisms with a nucleus and cytoplasm. Examples are malaria, amoeba, and flagellates. Transmission is usually through vectors and there's rarely transmitted from human to human contact. Uh, invasion and evasion, intracellular pathogens are susceptible to cell-mediated immunity and activated, activation of macrophages by T cells. Tissue damage, this may result um, directly from parasitic infestations in the tissue, or it can be a secondary um, immune inflammatory response by the individual. That's just some, some different areas that are affected by different types of parasites and protozoal infections. Viral infections, Viral, viruses are extremely simple microorganisms and they do not possess any metabolic organelles found in prokaryotes, such as bacteria or eukaryotes, such as human cells. Basic viral structure is the viron, which consists of a nucleic acid protected by a protein shell or the capsid. Now the capsid may take many characteristics. It can be helical, isohedral uh, or a large pleomorphic, such as with the pox virus. Transmission and colonization viruses are obligatory intracellular parasites. Thus, transmission is usually from one infected individual to another or from an animal reservoir. The viral life cycle is attachment, penetration, uncoating, and assembly. And we have invasion and evasion. The primary defense mechanisms against viruses include antibody that prevents viral entrance into the cell and cellular immunity that recognizes antigenic changes on the surface of infected cells. Different viral infections, you see quite a few of them can occur in different places throughout the body. Antimicrobials, um, antibiotics have the greatest effects on controlling infection. Antibiotics generally act by preventing the function of enzymes or cell structures that are unique to the infecting agent. The goal of antibiotic therapy is elimination of pathogenic microorganisms. And these are bactericidal, which kill the organism, or bacteriostatic, which inhibit the growth until the organism is destroyed by its own uh, individual's own protective mechanisms. Mechanisms of most antibiotics there's inhibition of function of, or production of cell walls. They prevent protein synthesis. They block DNA replication. Or there's interference with folic acid metabolism. And we do have the issue of antibiotic resistance. Um, 
in particular, uh, MRSA is an example there. And antimicrobials here are some different um, information on the different antimicrobials. Okay, last, let's talk about vaccines. The purpose of vaccine is to induce an active immunologic protection before exposure to the risk of infection. And again, IgG is what's used here for protection for vaccines. They can be attenuated, which means it contains a live virus that is weakened, such as with the MMR varicella. Hepatitis B, which can be a recombinant viral protein. Hepatitis A, which is inactivated killed cells. Polio, the CDC recommends vaccine with a killed virus. Bacterial vaccine for pneumococcal pneumonia, hemophilus influenza type B or the Hib, diphtheria, cholera, tetanus. These are all vaccinations against toxins. It's achieved using toxoids. Pertussis, which is an acellular vaccine. And we also have a thing called herd immunity in which about 85% of the population needs to be immunized in order to protect the entire total population. That's all that I'm gonna cover on these topics. Please be sure you are viewing the chapters in the textbook, um, the Kansen Huther textbook. Review those in their entirety as you're responsible for the entire chapters associated with this lecture. Thank you all so much for your time and I hope you have a great day.